with Kendrick pretty much as, he's a workaholic. I'm with him 24 7 in the studio. If we're out of town doing shows, if we're shopping, you know, everywhere we're at, we're just always together. That's, 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 that's my brother, my mentor. I look up to him. He's a, he's a, he's a smart individual. He's, he's a genius. He's, he's a workaholic as am I. Just Kendrick, you know, we, 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 we got this bond where we just, we just work. We McSpiley has been known as one of Kendrick Lamar's top collaborators and has shaped the sound of almost all of his albums, both on the mixing and recording side. In today's video, I'll be taking a look at three of Kendrick Lamar's top albums and how the mixing and recording process has evolved through each album. I'll also be taking a look at some of Ali's signature mixing techniques he used to craft these records. Section 80 was Kendrick's debut studio album, however the environment it was recorded in was far from studio quality. Mix Bailey recorded and mixed this project with just an interface and a broken microphone. Oh, the mic! I had like a, a Audio Technica, like some like two hundred dollar mic or a hundred dollar mic. Um, I had an M Audio interface um, and some AKG headphones, bro. And all things that I like stole off of Craigslist. We used to record on a broken microphone. You know, uh, the mic, the literally was it was broke, where you hear distortion coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And at the time, we had no money to go and just go to the store and go buy a new mic real quick. You know, a couple hundred bucks was, you know, that was a million dollars to us. So instead of, you know, just not recording, um, we, we added extra distor distortion on the plug-in side to mask the mic distortion to give it more of an effect. In addition to not being able to afford the proper studio equipment, he also couldn't afford tracked out beats. Wow. And at that time, like, we couldn't even afford tracked out beats. So we were, you know, getting two-track instrumentals and stuff like that. And we couldn't have, we couldn't break down the, the files, you know, right. because of two-track. Right. While initially this was a setback, it helped Ali shape his signature sound of using various effects and stereo imaging. So. I just start playing with effects. You know, if I can't play with the beat, then I'll just do something crazy to the vocals. Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, once Kendrick and everybody just realized that, you know, you could do more than just adding reverb and delay, right. that's when they just kind of gave me free reign to say, you know, just go crazy. Kendrick's next album, Good Kid Mad City, saw a major change in the mixing process. At the time, Dr. Dre became interested in Kendrick and decided to executive produce the album. It was during this process that Dr. Dre would become the mentor of Mixed by Ali. Because of this, Ali started working out of Interscope Studios. The front room Studio A was Dre's room, and the back room Studio B was where Mixed by Ali mixed. It was during this process that Dre taught Ali the art of mixing on the SSL console. Because like I was kind of sitting up on a Dre when we did the Good Kid Mad City, mm -hmm. before that I never mixed analog, everything was in the box. But, um, you know, just working with him, you know, he's SSL all the way down, you know, he, he go ham on the SSL. Mm -hmm. And um, again, like I was just saying, like the progress, and I'm seeing one, one of my mentors, what I feel is one of the best mixers out here today, yep. Yep. seeing how he works. So I just adopted that mm -hmm. and I, I try to make it work for me. But like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't my realm, it wasn't my world. Mm -hmm. So what, at that time, I had to find a way to make what I knew, which was everything in the box, compared to you know all the analog stuff that I didn't know. I'm a kid who never worked on a big ass board because I, right. I, I used to mix everything strictly in the box, mm. strictly in the computer only. I didn't right. use any outboard gear or nothing like that. And Dre does everything opposite. He does everything via um, like an SSL board, no outboard equipment. So I was able to learn the board from how he taught me and I took the things that I already knew from mixing in the box or in the computer mm. and I was able to mesh the two worlds together and that's how I created my own sound. Besides developing his signature skills on the SSL board, Ali also developed his mono or tone monitoring technique. We was doing Good Kid Mad City, you know what I'm saying? I was kind of just like, that was really like the training mm. to, to me, you know, becoming who I was per se, or who I am. And uh, just watching his process and how he manipulated certain things and used speakers for what they, what they really are, mm. I was able to just, um, just trying to find my own niche in it. Like mixing on one speaker, it doesn't sound pretty practical because you know a song is right. a stereo image of left and right. And the reason why I mix in mono, I say it all the time. Like I use a lot of effects and reverbs and stereo imaging where you know sounds are coming from left and right of the speaker. When I mix in mono on one speaker, I'm able to gauge things up and down instead of left and right. Mm. So I'm able to get a different type of clarity. I'm able to. Um, just, 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 just really see the depth in a song without. There was also a few additional mix techniques Ali learned from Dre. But you rolling top end off the kick drums. Nobody's doing that anymore. Nah, that's 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 them old school tricks you learned from Dre. You understand and you're thoroughly using high pass filters as a as a creative tool. Then. Absolutely. Ali also kept developing his own personal techniques, such as the use of effects. On um, on on. A bitch don't kill this vibe. What is it that's going on with that vocal? He does. You do it on several tracks. It, it was this chick, Anna Wise. We had her come in. She did um, oh. she did a layer under him, and then um, we, is she we, singing that high kind of ethereal part? Yeah, too? and then I'll ask you about I, that. Yeah, hey, I have I have this kind of this pitch thing that I do with her vocals, and I do a lot of like panning automations and making kind of mm -hmm. intertwine and sound real eerie, reverbed up and mm -hmm. delayed. So it was a harmonizer on her vocals. Yeah, on hers, on yeah, his. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
And what's the echo on that? The echo is so sweet. You yeah. remember? Yeah, uh, you, the actual plugin. Yeah. It was it was a, uh, the sound towards the Echo Boy. Oh wow. Echo Echo Boy and um, yeah, I just modified it. I added um, I think I added an imager to it to spread it out some. There's and, some kind of tight delay going on too. Like yeah, there's maybe two. Maybe 30, 40 milliseconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's on uh, that's on hers. There's there's two different delays on on right. both vocals. Right. One, that's what I'm that one you heard is on hers, yeah. and the other one uh, the Echo Boy is on his. And um. I got a note here about about that eerie sound on Anna's yeah. vocal. Uh, what, what reverb was that? It was the um, the Renaissance, the R verb. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and I tweaked that. I think I added some some a lot of high end to it, and, and I, I do a lot of imaging mm -hmm. on my on my like reverb. Man, and that's delays. an understatement. And that time, the vocal tracking setup also evolved significantly from the broken mic. Uh, tracking his vocal. What's your what's your signal path? Um, of course, I run through the C800 mic um, through 737. Mm -hmm. It, de it depends if he's rapping or if he's doing his harmonies or singing. It, it all depends, you know, on what we're working on. Yeah. You know, when he's rapping, you know, we use the C800. When he's doing like more melodic stuff, we use the uh, U47. While To Pippa Butterfly's work environment was similar to that of Good Kid Mad City, the sonic signature of the record was a complete mix up from his last records. Ali was challenged in the sense that he was tasked with recording live jazz bands and multiple live instruments, something he had little experience with. However, as in previous scenarios, Ali was able to take his lack of experience and used trial and error to figure out new and unique methods that gave this record a pretty interesting and fresh sound. I ran this guy down and I said, yo, we have a jazz record. Can you please help me make this record? <laughs> I don't know shit about I don't know jazz. what the fuck I'm doing. Can you <laughs> what, please? What <laughs> instrument? Start out going, man, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. And, then, and then it turned out great. The whole live. song, as soon as we sp spread, when we was recording it, matter of fact, but when we spread the mix out, you know, I was looking at all these instruments, you know, up, upright bass and, right. you know, all these, right. You know, You're like what the hell? Is yeah, this I'm, stuff, I'm right? just, I'm not. I, you know, I didn't come from a musical background. You know, I'm all about trial and error. You know, I jumped right into the shit. I, I got an interest in it, and I learned by myself. Favorite albums is uh, to Pimba Butterfly, um, and that's because you know we're coming off of Good Kid, Mad City, right? An album that you know just really sculpted a generation, and then Kendrick jumps into this. You know, this whole is a whole different sonic sound to how Pimba Butterfly sounds compared to, to compared to Good Kid, Mad City. So remind you, I'm I'm self-taught, wet behind the ears, you know, still figuring it out. And I go from a whole programmed album with programmed music to a live album recording 15 piece bands and mixing upright bass and doing things that I was not, you know, familiar with. You know, I had to do a lot of studying. I went back and listened to the Mo Better Blues soundtrack and a lot of a lot of Beatles. Abbey Road was on repeat, understanding just placement of drum elements and and and, and sonic textures. Um, but that that album taught me patience and it also taught me it's okay not to know everything. Because again, because I didn't know how to specifically blend an upright bass with a live program bass, you know, it, it again added to the creation of my sound, which is making sure it feels right rather than the ones and zeros lining up. So when I say it taught me patience, it taught me patience all around to just make me feel comfortable with not being you know, not knowing at all, if that makes sense. You know, I don't know if that answer made sense to you, but you know, that album stuck with me. Um, it helped me grow as a as a person, as an engineer, working with all these different elements. The board that I mixed the album with, uh, this I bought it. So this is the board from Interscope. Unlike the previous albums, the mixing process of this album was documented a bit more. Here's a clip of Ali going through the mixing techniques on these walls that he used on the drums. In this clip, you'll find some common threads between some of the techniques Dre taught him on Good Kid Mad City. Such as rolling off the top end of the drums. You get that, right? So let's look at the processing. Um, first bass drum, blue camera. So you go into an SSL, but you use an SSL for you before, or did you put that for us today? Uh, no, I use it on there. So basically what I do, I like to, even though I still run the SSL board EQ on all my mixes, I like to kind of do a negative of what I was doing before. So if I take out a lot of highs in the box, I would add more on the board because it gives it that much more warmth. Okay, so a two-step process. This is the bass drum, that live bass drum kick drum one without the SSL processing. Okay, so what you're doing here is you're actually high passing and low passing, making it super medium. -y. Cool, and then when you add it to the other one, this is the other one. So the other one has two levels of processing, SSL, and then this super fat full tech. Uh, so without anything, that 808 style kick sounds like this. Okay? Then you add the SSL. You have a like, typical SSL punch, right? That's really what it does. And then, 
add some of the bottom to get a little air. Yeah. So you add in uh, at 3K, a bit of a boost, at 3K for the medium bend to get that talk thing going on. And the two of them together. Exactly. So I rolled off a lot of high end on the, uh, on the live drum, on the live drum, because I wanted to keep, because there's two, at first there was only that one drum. There was never the other bass drum underneath it. Yeah. So I rolled off a lot of high end on that kick drum. Just so we can sit to right mind. If you play everything all together, yeah. I know it might move a little long to pass out. The mastering process of this record was also quite different. In order to achieve that 70s sound, Ali ran the record through an ATR 102 tape machine. I hope you all enjoyed watching this video on breaking down some mixed by Ali's techniques he's used on various Kendrick Lamar records. If you do enjoy this video, I'm considering making a video going super in depth into how the Bimba Butterfly was mixed. If you would like that, please leave a comment down below like the, and like the video to let me know. Anyways, I will see y'all later.